Everyone should be familiar with a Mercator map of the Earth. On the surface of the Earth, coordinates are represented by latitude and longitude. Latitude is expressed in degrees from the equator with plus or minus 90 representing the poles. A degree of latitude is about 111 kilometers or 69 statute miles, although it varies a bit since the Earth is not a sphere. Longitude is also measured in degrees from an arbitrary point and continues east and west for 180 degrees. The distance between longitude lines varies with latitude. The astronomical coordinate system represents the sphere of space observable from Earth. This is a Mercator map of the celestial sphere. The Milky Way is the gray band that oscillates between the top, north, part of the chart, and the bottom, south. The Earth's equator is projected into the sky. Objects said to be on the celestial equator are those objects that pass directly overhead of the Earth's equator during the course of a day. The constellations Orion, Virgo, Aquila, and Aquarius all lie on or near the equator. Like the Earth, positions north and south of the equator are measured as plus or minus 90 degrees. The term declination is used to be clear that we are referring to location in the sky. Locations east and west are measured in right ascension. This is the point where the celestial system differs from the land-based system. Right ascension is measured in 24-hour increments with minute and second subdivisions. The reason for this will be apparent in a moment. On the Earth, the zero longitude was arbitrarily defined as passing through Greenwich, UK. In the sky, the zero hour is defined as the point where the sun crosses the equator in March. My home is at latitude 37 degrees north. From here, the line projected by the equator crosses my southern sky. At the southern meridian, it is 53 degrees from the horizon. All of the constellations traveling along this line are directly above at the equator. The North Celestial Pole, which is directly above the Earth's North Pole, is 37 degrees from my north horizon. Looking directly overhead, those objects with a declination of plus 37 degrees pass directly over my head. If we watch the sky rotate, we can see why right ascension is measured in time instead of degrees. This is one hour later. The sky is moved by one hour of right ascension, 15 degrees, and so forth for the next hour. Every celestial object has a catalog position in RA and DEC. For example, the bright star Arcturus pictured here is at this location. The new general catalog, NGC, is the catalog of the brightest deep space objects. Each object in the catalog was numbered based on its RA. You can use the numbering system to get a rough idea of the RA of the object. You can also use the RA to get a crude idea whether an object is visible or not. The best viewing is towards the center of each band. I briefly introduced paper charts in section 1. The example in section 2 is based on using computer programs. Now I want to return to paper charts and to talk about the particulars of using them. As I said, many observers like using paper charts since using a computer introduces complexity in your observing. I'm going to discuss the two charts I use the most, the Pocket Sky Atlas and Uranometria. There are other chart books out there, but these are the two I'm most familiar with. As I said earlier, I mostly use a laptop. However, one chart book that I also frequently use, as you can see by its worn condition, is the Pocket Sky Atlas. I like that I can hold it in my hand at the eyepiece. The Pocket Sky Atlas is a set of eight slices through the sky. You can find the chart number of an object by looking in the index, or you can look at the overview pictured here. Each slice runs from pole to pole and is represented by ten double-page charts. This is a very convenient system since you could stay on a slice for the entire evening. I find this chart particularly useful when I want to go after bright show objects at the end of an evening. The other chart book I'd like to discuss is Uranometria. This is a more advanced book sold as two volumes, one covering the north and one the south. Unless you live very far north or south, you'll need both volumes. Uranometria uses a chart like this, simulated by SkyMap Pro, for the initial step of locating the constellation in the sky. Each volume has four high-level charts that allow you to orient yourself between the chart and the sky as we discussed in section 2. If this is not adequate, then a more detailed set of 22 charts covering the entire sky can be used. This is the chart that we would use to start the M38 hops discussed in section 2. Once you orient yourself, you then move to a more detailed chart like this one, again simulated by SkyMap Pro. I inset an extract from the real book. Uranometria plots extremely dim deep sky objects, many more than you will likely see in any but the largest telescopes. The stars are only plotted to magnitude 9.7. That's adequate for a finder. 
I'm simulating the chart that covers the M38 region. Uranometria supplies an acetate overlay that shows the various fields of view scaled to the chart. You could build your own with a compass. I use this overlay the same way I use the computer generated overlay I showed in section 2. In some cases you will need more detailed charts than one provided by even the most detailed paper chart. A reviewer of this video suggests that for more difficult objects you print the digitized sky survey image of the object. This is an example of one such chart that I created for a portion of the Large Magellanic Cloud. A computer program overlaid some of the object names, but even the raw DSS image is useful. Looking at the DSS image for more challenging objects is just good practice in any case. I have the full DSS image set on my laptop. Many programs now supply pictures of most objects or will let you download and overlay DSS images on your charts. It helps to know what it is you're looking for. If it's hard to see in the DSS image, it's probably not something you want to try in your 6-inch scope. Let me talk more about why charts need to be rotated. I already introduced one reason in section 1. If the chart is drawn with the north at the top of the chart, then it will have to be rotated most of the time to agree with the sky. Optics can also introduce some rotations. I want to briefly discuss this before presenting another star hopping example using paper charts and an inverting finder. In the end, I hope to show that the paradigm of rotate the chart fully covers this case. We will use a standard eye chart as our target. A correct viewfinder, or binoculars, will not introduce additional rotations or mirroring into the image. However, if you observe from the side like I do, the image will appear rotated relative to yourself. The image that you will see when you look into the eyepiece of a Newtonian telescope will be rotated about 180 degrees. In other words, it will be upside down. It is possible that some additional rotations may be introduced by the way the telescope is configured. A straight finder that does not have any internal prisms or diagonal will rotate the same way. The method that I am teaching of rotating your paper chart to agree with the sky will automatically correct for all of the rotations you will encounter with a Newtonian telescope, a refractor that does not have a diagonal, or a finder, either inverting or correct image. As a further example, let me demonstrate finding M38 again, this time using paper charts and a scope with an inverting finder. By looking at chart N4 of Uranometria, which I simulated earlier, I know that I need to turn to page 59 of Uranometria. I'm going to start with the top of the chart away from me. We'll worry about rotating it in a moment. Let's zoom into that portion of the chart where we'll be star hopping. I put the red dot on IOTA as discussed in section 2, and I'm now looking through my inverting finder. What happened to all the stars? In this example, I'm presenting a real-world problem that happened as I was putting this video together. I was observing closer to the central city, which means I saw fewer stars. Inconvenient, but we can still find what we're looking for. Let me prove it to you. As before, we have to find what patterns we can given the crummy sky. Since we can't filter the chart to match the sky, we will have to do it in our head. What are the brightest stars, the biggest dots, besides Iota? There are two stars at the 7 o'clock. Are these the green pattern from section 2? To see, let's rotate the chart. That looks promising. The two stars at the 7 o'clock are the green pattern from section 2, or at least that part of it that survived the lights. The red Y is nowhere to be found. However, I could see another star marked in purple. We are at the correct starring location and have determined our rotation. Since we rotated the chart, we could perform the star hop just as before. We pull or push the scope so the finder field of view moves as we need it to. In this case, we have to move towards the 2 o'clock. The inverting finder will make the movement less intuitive, but only slightly. Since we're moving the scope by looking in the finder, we have immediate feedback that our motions are correct. Once we're at our group of stars, we complete the star hop as described in section 2.